Join us for 16 Days of Glory next. Tonight's program is made possible by a grant from the Seagram Beverage Company. Seagram is proud to send family members of more than 550 American athletes to the Seoul Olympic Games for the honor of our country and glory of sport. For 16 Days of Glory, writer, producer, director, Bud Greenspan. On the afternoon of July 28, 1984, more than 5,000 young men and women met in Los Angeles to compete in friendly competition for the honor of their team and the glory of sport, the 1984 Los Angeles Olympic Games. We call our film on these games, 16 Days of Glory, a tribute to these marvelous young men and women. It will be to the everlasting glory of our time that there came forward at the turn of the last century some men with grand vision who turned this vision into a reality. There also came forward thousands of young men and women who entered the arena, took up the torch, made the attempt and pursued excellence, personifying the highest forms of the human spirit, talent, pride, courage, and perhaps most important, the ability to endure. They made this choice rather than sit timidly through their lifetimes as spectators without ever knowing the exultation of the competition, whether it end in victory or defeat. And because they made this choice, they are given a very special name. They are called Olympians, and they compete in a very special place. It is called the Olympic Games. So let's relive those marvelous moments of 1984, 16 days of glory on the playing fields of Los Angeles. many months, seven words symbolized all the planning that would lead to this hour, lead to this place. The seven words, the world is coming to Los Angeles. And so this day many thought would never arrive, did in fact happen. At 
4.30 in the afternoon of July 28, 1984. The world came to Los Angeles. century, Los Angeles and its Coliseum play host to the Olympic Games. Ladies and gentlemen, a salute to the nations of the 23rd Olympiad. The flags of 140 nations form a giant mosaic. They came from countries whose history is centuries old. And they came from newly formed nations, which just two decades ago were not yet born. Eighteen invited countries did not send teams. Thirteen followed the lead of the Soviet Union in boycotting the games. of the tall flags. The tall flags serve as the protectors of the Antwerp flag, the five-ringed Olympic symbol presented to each Olympic city since the games were held in Antwerp in 1920. The five interlocking rings symbolize the joining in brotherhood of all the nations of the world. Each nation represented here today has at least one color of the rings in its national flag. Mayor Bradley of Los Angeles receives the flag from the president of the International Olympic Committee, Juan Antonio Samaranch. a day of special celebration. It's been said, before you stand the finest group of young men and women ever to assemble in the history of sport. As he speaks, one reporter types the lead to his story. It reads, the athletic competitions are still a day away, but the first gold medal has already been won. It goes to Peter Uberoff. Now Juan Antonio Samaranch, President of the International Olympic Committee. The President of the United States of America. President Ronald Reagan to proclaim the Games of the 23rd Olympiad in Los Angeles open. God bless America. Celebrating the 23rd Olympiad, 
of the modern era, I declare open the Olympic Games of Los Angeles. of peace. Olympic decathlon in Rome. America's greatest athletes, Olympic gold medalist, Rayford Johnson.
Dave and Linda Moorcroft live with their family in Coventry, some 90 miles north of London. Dave Moorcroft was born here and today supervises sports programs for the children of Coventry. Dave Moorcroft is esteemed in Great Britain. He is admired for his devotion to children and for one magnificent day in July of 1982. On this day in Oslo, Moorcroft wins the 5,000 meters in world record time, running the distance nearly six seconds faster than anyone has before. <laughs> 28 years earlier, Roger Bannister became the first man to run the mile under four minutes. Now Dave Moorcroft has a chance to become the first man in history to run the 5,000 meters under 13 minutes. He misses by less than half a second, but incredibly breaks the world record by more than five seconds. Though the Los Angeles games are two years away, Dave Moorcroft's performance is so impressive, he immediately becomes one of the favorites to win the 5,000 meter Olympic gold medal. It is Thursday, August 9, 1984, the Los Angeles Coliseum. In the two years since his incredible world record run in Oslo, Dave Moorcroft has been beset with crippling injuries. He has not fully recovered from a stress fracture of the leg, a debilitating attack of hepatitis, and a pelvic disorder that on certain days makes it impossible for him to run. Moorcroft has advanced to the semifinal after having a comparatively easy race the day before in the qualifying round. The runners must circle the 400 meter track 12 and a half times. In his semi-final this day, Moorcroft faces a difficult challenge. John Walker of New Zealand, the 1976 Olympic 1500 meter champion who has moved up to the 5,000 meters, and 23-year-old Saeed Awida of Morocco. Awida, number 622, wearing the green shirt and red shorts, has run the second fastest 5,000 meters in history, only four seconds slower than Moorcroft's world record time. Awida has a superb competitive record. A few weeks before the games, he announced he would run the 1,500 meters, an event in which he has run the fastest time of the year. Shortly before opening day, he withdrew from the 1500, but remained in the 5,000 meter race. With 200 meters left in his semifinal, Moorcroft has survived the test. He is running without pain. The Moroccan, Awida, leads Moorcroft running on the inside and John Walker on the outside. But this finish has little meaning. The first six men in each semifinal qualify for the final. I felt comfortable in the semi-final, but it is very difficult to tell exactly how the others are feeling because you're all trying to conserve energy, if you like, trying to run as, as easily as you can to qualify. And I was aware that uh, Awita and Walker and others were running reasonably quickly, um, but I was also aware that I, that I felt comfortable at that pace. It is two days later. More than 90,000 spectators await the final of the 5,000 meters. Two of the spectators are Linda and Paul Moorcroft. Dave Moorcroft's wife and son. I had spoken to Dave in the morning of the race and I asked how he felt and he said he felt fine and the injury was playing him up but no more than usual. It wasn't until I actually saw him warming up that I realized something was amiss. He seemed to be dragging his leg a little. It was very stiff and it was obvious that his pelvis had, had tilted again. At that point I was particularly thinking should I be running? But I guess you know, you're sort of hoping for a miracle. And I was, tr I was trying my best to, 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 to sort of forget the fact that the warm-up hadn't gone too well and the fact that within a couple of laps of the final, I'm, it might disappear and I might be running reasonably freely. The race begins. There are 14 finalists. Saeed Awida of Morocco falls comfortably into third place to ensure a fast pace. But for Dave Moorcroft, there is anguish. He is in intense pain. Just a few seconds into the race, Moorcroft is third from last. 
I was absolutely certain then that there was no way I could keep with the pace. And uh, that there are a million different emotions. There's an element of panic, there's, there's disappointment, there's, um, there's being scared that you won't finish. Basically, all you're trying to do is put one foot in front of another as quickly as you can do. But you know that that quickly is, is nowhere near as quickly as the guys in front. After two laps, Dave Moorcroft is in last place. I still hoped he could get into the race. I still hoped that perhaps he could salvage something. But by the fourth lap, his injury was hurting him so much that he couldn't salvage anything. And I realized the pace was so fast that um, he just couldn't get into the race. With seven laps to go and his chances of victory gone, Dave Moorcroft had thoughts about his wife, Linda, watching from the stands. It was a very difficult situation for her because she could do nothing about it. I knew that she'd watched me do training sessions when things had gone badly. You know, knew what I was going through. I've never, never ever dropped out of a race yet, mainly because I think once you do, then you, you, you've given yourself an option for the future. But I must admit, I'd have been uh, quite happy if somebody dragged me off the track. <laughs> Coming down the stretch with two laps to go, six men are still in contention. Antonio Leitao of Portugal leads followed by Saeed Awida of Morocco, Marcus Riffle of Switzerland third, Tim Hutchings, Great Britain fourth, followed by the two Kenyans, Paul Kipkoyech and Charles Chariot. The fast pace has forced John Walker of New Zealand to break off the challenge. All eyes are on the leaders. But for Dave and Linda Moorcroft, there is another race, a personal one. Pride. Pride known only to them. More than 350 meters behind the leaders, Moorcroft is in danger of being lapped. I felt like bursting into tears. In fact, I was, I was sort of secretly hoping that he would pull out because I just didn't want to, to sit and have to watch him go further and further back. And I was praying that he wouldn't be lapped. I thought, please, please don't let him be lapped. With one lap to go, like how... Up front, there is one lap to go. Leitao of Portugal leads with Saeed Awida of Morocco at his shoulders second. Marcus Riffle of Switzerland in the all red uniform is third. With 250 meters left, Saeed Awida makes his move. He passes Leitao of Portugal. On the outside, Marcus Riffle of Switzerland also passes Leitao. Into the final turn, Awida leads. 30 meters in front, Dave Moorcroft fears he will be lapped. An element of panic set in because I didn't want to look behind like a frightened rabbit. Even to the point that coming down the finishing state, and I'd still got a lap and a bit to go, I pulled out to the second lane because I thought if they're going to go past me, I don't want to at least get in their way. Dave Moorcroft gains his personal triumph. Saeed Awida of Morocco wins the Olympic gold medal. recognition of what has been done. Saeed Awida becomes the first man to win a gold medal for Morocco. And Dave Moorcroft has completed his long, painful journey with honor. Switzerland, silver medal. Antonio Leitao, bronze. The victory scoreboard records the first eight finishes. 
in the upper right hand corner the world record time of dave moorcroft a final honor and tribute to the magnificent day two years earlier when he ran the fastest 5,000 meters ever springboard and platform diving began one columnist wrote there are two categories of divers there are those who perform with magnificent skill grace beauty and courage then there is Greg Luganus afternoon of August 8, each of the finalists in the men's springboard competition took 11 dives. Nine, eight and one half, nine. Greg Luganis of the United nine, States led from the first dive nine, and increased his lead throughout the afternoon. In the preliminaries and final, he was awarded a perfect 10, nine times. Greg Luganis, a reverse one and one half somersaults, three and one half twists free. 92 points. Winner of the gold medal representing the United States of America, Olympic champion, Greg Luganis. Now he would attempt to become only the third diver in Olympic history to win both the springboard and platform events. For Greg Luganis, the need to excel had its beginnings when he was a child. When I was a kid, I had a very bad speech impediment. And so it was difficult for me when I was growing up because, you know, I'd get up in front of the classroom and, and read, and it was so frustrating because I'd, I'd make all these mistakes and everybody would laugh at me and I, you know, I was ridiculed and everything. And it was so frustrating that I just shut up. And that's when I directed all my time and energy into what I could do physically. I could show people that I could, I could dance, I could tumble, I, I, I could dive.
extremely dangerous reverse three and a half somersault tuck. If he executes it well, he will be the first diver in history to score more than 700 points in the platform event. One year earlier, a Soviet diver was killed when his head hit the platform at the start of the dive, more than 32 feet above the water. I was on the platform when, when the Russian executed the dive. I was on the platform, and the way that I knew that he hit the platform was I felt the tower shake. And my first reaction was to run out to the end and, you know, jump in, try and help him. But, you know, that was very difficult to do, to remove yourself emotionally from something because it was such an emotional thing that happened.
9.30 the evening of August 1st at Pauley Pavilion on the campus of UCLA. There, the magnificent Romanian team of six young gymnasts stands on the highest step of the victory platform, the winner of the gold medal for the team championship. Standing beneath them on the podium in second place, the team from the United States. Their silver medal is the highest award ever won in Olympic competition by an American women's team. The team competition has direct bearing on the individual all-around championship that will take place in two days. Half of each gymnast's individual total in the team competition is carried over and added to their final score in the battle for the individual all around. It is two days later. The 36 finalists for the individual all around are introduced to the 13,000 spectators who fill Pauley Pavilion. Under Olympic rules, only the three highest scorers from each team advance to the individual all-around championship. This rule prevents the other three members of both the American and Romanian teams from competing. Of the seven highest qualifiers, three come from Romania and three from the United States. The Romanian qualifiers, Simona Pauca, Laura Cutina, and Ekaterina Zabo. Representing the United States, Kathy Johnson, Mary Lou Retton, and Julianne McNamara. Four events would be contested. Uneven bars, balance beam, vault, and floor exercise, so that all the apparatus can be contested simultaneously. The 36 finalists are divided into four groups of nine. Mary Lou Retton and Ekaterina Zabo are in different groups. There is additional drama this night. One of the spectators is Nadja Komenich, who electrified the sports world at the 1976 Montreal Olympics when she became the first gymnast in Olympic history to score a perfect 10. Also at the competition, Nadja Komenich's former coach, Bella Caroli. Bella Caroli now coaches in the United States. His two most famous pupils, Julianne McNamara and Mary Lou Retton. Bella Caroli is here in no official capacity. The head coach of the American women's team is Don Peters, one of the most respected men in gymnastics. However, Bella Caroli has obtained credentials in the technical capacity as an equipment representative. In first place, as the competition begins, a surprise. 16-year-old Mary Lou Retton of the United States. Trailing by just 15 hundredths of a point, Ekaterina Zabo of Romania. On her first apparatus, the balance beam, Ekaterina Zabo reinforces the many predictions that call for her to win this individual all-around competition. She scores a perfect 10. Earlier on the same apparatus, Julianne McNamara had all but eliminated herself from gold medal possibilities, receiving low scores from the judges. She falls from third to fifth place. Simona Pauca of Romania moves from seventh to fourth with a marvelous 9.95. Meanwhile, at the uneven bars, as her coach Bella Caroli urges her on, Mary Lou Retton scores well, but not high enough to remain alone in first place. After one round, Ekaterina Zabo and Mary Lou Retton are tied for the lead. In the second rotation, the balance beam becomes the undoing for Kathy Johnson of the United States in her quest for a medal. Mary Lou Retton stays in contention with a 9.8, but falls to second place overall when Ekaterina Zabo comes through with a 9.95 in her floor exercise.
after two rotations, Akaterina Sabo leads Mary Lou Retton by 15 hundredths of a point, the exact margin by which she trailed when the evening began. The third apparatus for Zabo is the vault. She scores a 9.9. .9. Meanwhile, at the floor exercise, Mary Lou Retton is magnificent. of a point behind the Romanian Zabo. The battle for the gold medal is narrowed down to the last apparatus. Zabo will compete first on the uneven bars. She will have completed her exercise before Mary Lou Retton competes on the vault. Zabo can clinch the gold medal with a perfect 10. Okay, ready for the vault now. is clear. Zabo's final score has now been determined. Okay. If Retton scores a perfect 10 in the vault, the gold medal is hers. If she gets a 9.95, she and Ekaterina Zabo will share the gold medal. If Retton scores anything less than a 9.95, the gold medal will belong to Zabo. The control, you know what means height, okay, going flat to me. Yes, read the back, it's good. It's everything all right now, all right? Okay, from now it's all right. You are going for it. You are going for that one. That's going to be a good vault. Make sure you're on the, on the, on the warm-up. Go nicely. Hit it up first. Hit it the second and try to feel it already. Do it full speed. To, car to feel the landing. Okay? Very good. Never better. Okay? The best, the best what you can vault. All right? I'm gonna see you now, now or never, okay? And you're gonna make it, okay? Let's go high nicely, stroke it down, bang! All right? Nothing else, just control after the landing. Okay, nice high and control the landing, all right? And you can control it. I know that you can control it. There is no way. One turn, another turn is coming now. It's gonna be everything you want.
there is fear that Mary Lou Retton will be penalized by the judges if Bella Caroli moves onto the floor. In 1979, Los Angeles was awarded the Olympic Games for the second time. They held the first games, of course, in the summer of 1932. A few days after the announcement, Peter Uberoth was named president of the Los Angeles Olympic Organizing Committee. I met Peter in the summer of 1980, and we became very good friends. He had a small office in Santa Monica, seven people working for him. And through the years, we had many conversations about the philosophy of what the film would be like. We both agreed that we would like to tell the human side of the Olympic spirit, the human side of the Olympic philosophy. Through the years, Peter has been very helpful in what the film was going to be all about. We met on many occasions, and we met recently to talk about those magnificent days, in particular opening day on July 28th, 1984. Peter, it's opening day, five years in the waiting since 1979. The teams of 140 countries are marching in. In particular, the crowd reacted magnificently to China, Romania, Yugoslavia, three that really were not expected two or three years earlier. What were your thoughts when, when the crowd just responded so vociferously? Basically, I thought, what a great way to show the true character of the American people. The love, the, the understanding, the appreciation for athletes who had suffered, the, you know, the People's Republic, it was really, really their first real effort at the Olympic Games. They had, as you know very well, they had one athlete once before, I guess in 1932. Uh, they, the response, unprogrammed, unthought out, uh, has been shown to the Chinese people on television in China a hundred times. It's been made into movies in China and it's uh, being uh, shown in the great halls for those who don't have television. It was a response from people to people. And I, and I thought that's what the Olympics is about. It's about uh, the fact this world is getting smaller and you need to come out of the field to play together as friends. And, uh, and yes, compete. And yes, have your flags. But at the same time, do it peaceably and with understanding and friendship. And tell us about how you got the Romanian team to come. There was talk about they being the key team to come to the United States from the East European bloc. Well, you know, Bud, the, uh, the Romanian team is, was a special moment for me. Uh, I took Nadia Comaneci, who was with me in the, my box, out into the crowd. I said, I want you to hear the reaction. She said, there won't be any reaction at all. And here's the poorest of the Soviet bloc countries who had defied the Soviet call for a boycott. And this, this ovation that was virtually the same as the United States team got by these people, most of whom didn't know where Romania even was. So I, it's a high point for me. Was that your idea, Peter, the 11 great American heroes of the past carrying the Olympic flag into the stadium? Well, the Olympic Charter calls for uh, the, the soldiers to carry in this, uh, the Olympic flag. And I figured that'd be the last thing we'd want. And so we went and got Olympians, women and men of the past who were, were great stars at one time in their career. But also, we had another criteria. We only took people who had donated hours and hours, really years of their lives, to the Olympic movement. You know, from uh, uh, Sammy Little, Sammy Lee, to uh, Perry O'Brien. It was very special. Peter, it's now 16 days later. The flame has just gone out. You were kind enough to say that uh, you saw the games watching our film. Uh, did you see the games? I didn't see them at all. 
was a it was a blur. I, I was I was at some competition, uh, but I would be there for uh, five eight minutes, and I'd often be in the underbelly of the stadiums and walking around and talking to volunteers and going to the hospitals that were set up in every single stadium and medical centers and talk to the people in the parking lots who never got to see the games who were not paid also. They're just volunteers standing in the sun and uh, tell them, can you make it? Can you make it through these games? Can you stay at the job? And encouraging them, and then solving problems. It's you know, really an executive's uh, uh, job to do. So I never saw really any competition. And emotionally, uh, I really couldn't take time if, to, to, to think even about enjoying it. I had to figure that, uh, that I'd have a chance to do that later. And uh, thank goodness to you, because you, 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 know, you tell the story. You don't just put film with athletes. You tell the story and, uh, you know, very quietly, uh, kind of hidden away, uh, my wife and I, we sit and, and we, uh, we watch the games uh, basically through your, your eyes. Many people have been to an Olympics, have said, whatever happens afterward, whatever has gone on before, this is the moment. Were the Olympic Games the moment for you? In a way, Bud, I look at it as a mountain. I tried to tell all the people who are going to work hard on those games, we're going to climb this mountain together. And as we get near the top, the air will be fairly rarefied, and it'll be painful. And we may bleed, but we'll make it to the top. And then we'll come down easily. And I think that that's what's happened. So I look at it as a mountain to, that we climbed and climbed successfully. I don't want to climb that mountain again. I'll try and find other mountains in my life, and I have. And I'll, and I, but uh, it was certainly one of the highlights. Uh, one of the highlights because it took so many people going in the same direction and making it successful. But that, that's my philosophy of life. I think that, uh, that in this free country, in a free society, if enough people care about any kind of project at all, uh, we can do about anything as a nation, as a free people. And that was a good example of it, and one that shouldn't be forgotten. That's it for now. On our next program, we'll feature the decathlon, the dramatic confrontation between Daley Thompson of Great Britain the defending Olympic champion, and Jürgen Hinkson of West Germany, the world record holder. The winner to be given the title, the finest all-around athlete in the world. My name is Bud Greenspan. <laughs>